Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I want to welcome you to our Morehouse Lecture. The Morehouse Lecture was named after what we now know as STM and was established in 1962 to bring lecturers in who are engaged in the creation and teaching of Catholic theology. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kristen Kohlberg as our Morehouse speaker. Dr. Kohlberg received her Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School and her doctorate from the University of Notre Dame. She serves as the only theologian from the United States on the Theological Commission supporting the current Synod on Synodality. She has worked on the Synod at every stage on the local, national, continental, and universal levels. Dr. Kohlberg is also active in ecumenical dialogue and is appointed by the Vatican to the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission her expertise include ecclesiology, ecumenism, and Vatican II. And we'll have copies of her books available for sale following the lecture. As a Yale student and a frequenter of STM, she spent two years working at Morehouse as a graduate assistant and weekly volunteering at the soup kitchen with her now husband and theologian colleague, Sean. So please help me to welcome Dr. Kristen Kohlberg as she addresses a topic, the Synod on Synodality and Insider's View. So we're looking forward to those insiders. <laughs> I cannot tell you what a complete honor and joy it is to be here. I, I, I will not gush about it for a long time, but all of us know that there's special places in our life, special points in our journey. And St. Thomas More was absolutely one for me. It was a life-changing community and place, and all that I do now, I was formed to do it in part by the time I spent here. So all of you students and grad students out there and, and people who are, are watching us on the live stream, um, the work that you do now really matters and the friendships you have now matter and they continue to shape you for your whole life. So I'm delighted to be here to give a talk called The Synod on Synodality, an Insider's View. So I want this to be a little bit of a mix between uh, what's going on in uh, the Catholic Church today what is this synod that has kind of taken over our church? And also kind of the insider tidbits that uh, the scoop from behind the scenes. Okay, so I'm gonna see. Oops, sorry, I gotta go back. All right, so just briefly, I don't know how much people know about the synod, so I'm just gonna have a two or three minute intro. Synod comes from the word the prefix sin meaning same and hodos meaning path. So a synod is to walk together. It is to make decisions um, for the health of the church. This is one of the oldest parts of our tradition. So if we look all the way back to the earliest church and we look to Acts, we see that synods are gatherings of witnesses. Normally, when there's something going on uh, that pertains to the health of the body of the church, these bishops would gather as witnesses to make binding decisions. So the word synod in Latin and the word, the, the word synod in Latin and the word council in Greek are synonyms. So, for example, the Second Vatican Council often refers to itself as a sacred synod. So we can use those two words pretty much interchangeably. Now, <clears throat> normally councils, there are 21 ecumenical councils in the church's life, and normally they were called to deal with a clear and present danger, okay? Something is going on in the church, usually that is gonna potentially fragment the church. So the church has to act really quick in response to this danger. So I like to say, this is the Heisman Trophy. I took a picture of it uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, I like to say that most councils met in a very defensive posture, okay? They're meeting because a threat is going on. And so they're usually trying to act quickly um, to stop a conversation. That's gonna be really important in a minute. Okay, one little more piece of history before we move on. The earliest councils in the church's tradition take their model from the Roman Senate, okay? So the church doesn't just come up with this ways of making decisions, it, it's borrowing from its context. 
And what's really important about the Roman Senate is that the Roman Senate puts forth observable laws, okay? Um, it governs observable behavior. So councils, for much of the church's tradition, focus on juridical teachings, making laws. Now, that's really important, my friends, because we get a big uh, deviation from this with our good friend, Paul, John the 23rd. John the 23rd calls Vatican II not because he wants to govern observable behavior, not because he wants to come up with juridical laws, but because he wants to update the church. He wants to engage in this aggiornamento. So we say sometimes that Vatican II is this shift from a council focusing on observable behavior and laws to internal conversion, okay? Vatican II was about updating, it was about a move towards individual holiness, and it was about individual conversion. In my mind, you can never have too many pictures of Vatican II, so <laughs> here is the bishops leaving one session of Vatican II. Here is a scene from the inside of uh, St. Peter's during Vatican II. And next is my all-time favorite picture of Vatican II. Are we ready? Okay. <laughs> so after every session of the council, these buses, these luxurious buses, would take the bishops and the cardinals to their guest houses where they were staying. So. If you read the diaries of the major players at Vatican II, what you find out is, as we all know from our own working context, a lot of the, most of the work got done on the bus, okay? <laughs> People sitting next to each other and saying, what committee were you in today? What advances did you talk about today? And all of these things got done in these informal environments of the coffee bars and the dormitories and the bus. So Vatican II, my friends, was this moment of closeness for the Catholic Church. It was this gathering of the church, coming together, getting to know each, know each other. It was the first time that the Catholic Church really met as a world church, where bishops from every corner of the globe came together. Now, I'm getting up to the Synod. This is Paul VI. At the end of Vatican II, Paul VI said to himself, hasn't this been this wonderful coming together where we got to know each other as brothers and sisters, where we experienced this closeness? So at the end of Vatican II, Paul VI mandated that synods would become a regular part of the church's life, okay? So what I'm trying to underscore for you is a point that's going to be very dear to my heart in this next half an hour. The current synod process is really rooted in the theology and the style and the experience of the Second Vatican Council, okay? So the shift that we experience away from this kind of concern for observable behavior and juridical laws to updating and closeness and experiences, that's what Paul VI was trying to capture when he instituted synods. So here we have Pope Francis right after his election. Pope Francis comes out and he greets uh, the people in St. Peter's Square and he does this remarkable thing. He asks everyone listening or gathered there to pray for him. Then he does some uh, peculiar things. He gets back on the bus with the rest of his brothers to go pay his hotel bill. Mm -hmm. So right away we see that Pope Francis is going to have a new style of papacy, which is really rooted in his experience of being formed by the Second Vatican Council. So sometimes we say that Pope Francis is a pope of many firsts. And one of his firsts, besides being the first Jesuit, the first uh, pope from Latin America, the first Pope to take the name Francis. Pope Francis was the first Pope since Vatican II that
that wasn't at Vatican II, okay? He was shaped by the council. He wasn't a shaper of the council. So John Paul II, Pope Benedict were incredibly influential at Vatican II. But Pope Francis is really a young man during the council, and he's taking all of this in, this idea of closeness, this idea of conversion, this idea about um, updating. So on October 17th, 2015, Pope Francis gave an incredibly famous address. And I put the date on there because it is, he's, he is honoring in this address the 50th anniversary of Pope Paul VI instituting synods, okay? So very soon after his election, he gives this address and he says something that us ecclesiologists find interesting. He says, synodality is what God desires for the church in the third millennium. Now, I studied ecclesiology at Yale Divinity School, the study of the church. I studied it for six years at Notre Dame. And I'm telling you, the word synodality was never used once, okay? We talked about synods as a noun all the time, but we never talked about synodality. So Pope Francis was doing something different. <clears throat> so I just want to underscore something about this, the, how radical Pope Francis's plan was for just a minute. Because one thing I want everyone in this room and everyone who's watching to take away from this presentation is that something amazing and radically beautiful is happening in our church. We are living in a historic moment in the Catholic Church's history where the Holy Spirit is working in our church in a completely amazing way. So when Pope Francis looks at the world, okay, when Pope Francis becomes the Pope and he looks out at the world, <laughs> Pope Francis isn't just looking to solve like Catholic problems. Okay? He's not looking for specifically problems related um, you know, to the Catholic faith. He's looking at the world. And Pope Francis is seeing what we see. He sees um, racial inequality. He sees poverty. He sees climate change. He sees now the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what Pope Francis sees and what Pope Francis thinks about is, how can the Catholic Church lend its wisdom, lend its resources to these things that are obstacles to human flourishing? So what Pope Francis sees, some of us in the business world might be familiar with this phrase, he sees what we call VUCA, which is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. <clears throat> A, a later sociologist has, has said maybe there's an update to VUCA. VUCA is like when a society experiences multiple meltdowns of, of a system meltdown, okay? I just want to spend one minute on this. A sociologist more recently has said maybe after COVID we're living in a world of, called BANI. BANI is, B is for brittle. If you're like me, after the COVID pandemic, um, even small things can feel overwhelming. <laughs> we feel like we don't have always the emotional and, and mental resources to deal with our problems. We, we feel um, that trusted organizations can break down without warning. We feel anxious. There is constant worry that the next catastrophe is around the corner. And is nonlinear. We can't explain developments. We, things don't make sense. They don't always pro progress in an order that we understand. And part of the problem is not that the information that we're receiving, there's, there's a lack of information. The information is overwhelming, OK? It's incomprehensible because we cannot process all the information. So I think we could look around our world and we could agree that our world is experiencing some of what this VUCA and this BANI is trying to communicate. And what we find is that that often leads to polarization, okay? 
So if we look at national leaders that try to deal with VUCA and BANI, we see people trying to draw clear lines and to create us versus them and to kind of come up sometimes with oversimplified answers like they can solve all the problems. But Pope Francis is looking at VUCA and BANI and he's responding with listening. He's responding with listening. I think that one of the greatest contributions of the Synod is that Pope Francis is modeling for the world a different way of responding to our context right now. It's truly, truly amazing to me. So if we think about the Synod and Pope Francis, the listening sessions that Pope Francis mandated, he never said, you can't talk about this question, or you can't talk about that question, or here's the four things you're allowed to talk about. Pope Francis said, what is the Holy Spirit calling the church to today? Just opening the conversation and just with tremendous humility and tremendous confidence. So here is young Pope Francis, right? During the time he was ordained, right around the time of the council. <clears throat> Again, seeing the council as this moment of the Holy Spirit of a new Pentecost. Okay, one quick statement. Um, in the earliest church, there is a belief that the church is always reforming itself. The church is always in a state of reform. That part of the church's life is to always be in a process of reform. But when we get to the Reformation, sometimes in the Catholic Church, for several decades and even centuries, the re word reform became kind of a negative word. Okay, that reform is something we do only when there's an emergency or a reform means that something has to change and that causes our beliefs into question. But Vatican II brings us back to this idea that Christ summons the church to continual reformation. And Pope Francis, one of his first homilies, uses this phrase, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, the church always needs to be renewed because its members are sinners and need conversion. So Pope Francis is taking this ancient idea of the church is always engaged in an act of reform. And reform isn't just for an emergency situation, but reform of the whole church so that the church can be a more authentic version of itself. So Pope Francis takes Vatican II absolutely as a foundation for synodality, okay? He calls it, again, for internal conversion, for updating, for walking together. The style of it is not juridical laws, but homiletic, aspirational, asking questions. And he takes much of the theology from the council and uses it at the synod. <clears throat> I'm gonna go over this part for a moment. Um, one of the most important things we get at Vatican II, which is really the heart of the current synod process, is that for many years, we saw the church primarily in terms of its visible characteristics and as an institution. A lot of this happens after the Reformation where we're trying to define who we are in the face of the questions of some of the reformers. So for many, many decades, the Catholic Church, when it describes itself, it starts by talking about its hierarchy or its authority. All right, friends. I flew here from Minnesota to tell you this. Vatican II gives us a vision of the church that's rooted in baptism, okay? When we start to talk about the church, we talk about the inclusion of all the baptized. Rather than starting with authority and hierarchy, we start with baptism. This, for those of you who have suffered with, with rightfully so, through reading, this is Karl Rahner, <laughs> one of the hardest theologians to read. But Karl Rahner always says that councils are always both an end and a beginning. They're an end because they answer certain questions, but they're a beginning because they raise new questions. So what I'm gonna tell you today is that what Pope Francis is saying is that Vatican II was a beginning and we've never fully lived all of its reality in our church today. An enormous part of the synod is saying, if we start to define our church with baptism, 
What does that mean for how we live? Pope Francis is going to say, Vatican II does this amazing thing by saying we have to start by thinking about baptism, but we've never really thought about what does that mean for our theology of authority? What does that mean for our understanding of the priesthood? What does that mean for our theology of the people in the pews? So the synod is an effort to more deeply understand some of the theology of Vatican II. Okay, there's yours truly. This is the opening day of the Synod. <clears throat> now, just really quickly, you might ask yourselves, Chris and Kohlberg, why are you the one theologian from the United States who's on the Synod's Theological Commission? Part of it is because I wrote a book on comparing Vatican I and Vatican II, where I really tried to say, what is the Catholic Church saying about the papacy? And how is the papacy as the center not in contradiction with a more diverse style of authority that we get in Vatican II. So what is the role of the Pope in a more dynamic and diverse church? Because I wrote that book, I was appointed by the US bishops. I'm over there on the left. I served on the Reform Catholic Dialogue for five years. After that, I served on the, Ang and I'm currently on the Anglican Catholic Dialogue, where Anglicans want to ask us, Tell us again what you think about the, the Pope. How, <laughs> tell us again how you understand the universal level of the church. And Catholics say to Anglicans, you guys have a very developed sense of regional, national authority. Tell us how you understand that kind of authority. So, so Pope Francis appointed many of the theologians on the Synod are also on ecumenical dialogues because he wants the synod to fuel ecumenical exchange and because the synod is about listening and ecumenical dialogue is about listening, okay? So here is the Pope's Instagram feed from the day the synod opened. This was sent to me by one of the monks at my monastery. He said, Kristen, you didn't get the memo that you were supposed to wear black. <laughs> You're the only one who is wearing neon blue. So when Pope Francis addressed the Theological Commission, what Pope Francis said is, and I, I always think this word is so interesting, I want you to probe the ecclesiology of the people of God. So he's saying, this is the Vatican II ecclesiology of baptismal membership coming before authority. He's like, what does that mean for our church? What would the church look like if it fully lived the ecclesiology of Vatican II. So this is the Synod on the Family from 2018, and this is in one of the aulas. That was the one I was sitting in where I was wearing my neon blue vest, jacket. But this, so this is what the Synod on the Family looked like. This is what the Synod I attended looked like. Everyone was broken up into groups of about 15 people by language, and we sat around a circle and everyone had two minutes to share. What do you think the Holy Spirit is calling the church to today? Now, for you architecture students in the room, perhaps, or you know, all of us, what's going on in this room and what's going on in this room are two different things, okay? And they represent two different theologies, two different understandings of the church. So this is us. We had such a powerful conversation. This is us afterwards. This is me with Cardinal Togley. He said at the end, I want to take a picture with the young people. And he pointed at me, and I was so delighted to be considered a young person. I, I love this picture. So again, two different visions. These, to me, as a person who studies the church, are telling us two different understandings of the church. OK. Quick, I'm gonna keep moving here. So this is the original timeline for the Synod, and it was supposed to begin in October of 2021, and in April of 2022, all the dioceses in the world were supposed to hand in their reports. And even at that meeting in, in October, all the bishops said, Holy Father, we can't get April. You want us to hold these meetings and get these teams together and train them in April. Oof. We, need a we need an extension. 
Then other bishops said, Holy Father, this process just started. You can't change the timeline within the first week. You're going to look like the Catholic Church doesn't know what it's doing. Pope Francis prayed on it, and two days later, he came back, and he extended the deadline. Because he said, this is about listening. It's not about following a timeline preset. And if my brother bishops are telling me they need more time, so the deadline was extended. So Pope Francis mandated that 2,898 particular churches had to hold these listening sessions. So in the US, we have 196 particular churches, and they're divided into 15 regions that they use for like voting purposes. Most lay people, we wouldn't know this. The reason I bring it up is because the US also had region 16. Region 16 was for any group of, of Catholics in the country that didn't feel like they were just housed in one diocese or didn't feel comfortable submitting their uh, report through a diocese. So like um, cat, divorced Catholic women of America, um, people who had suffered cl clergy sexual abuse, um, people who had left the Catholic Church but still wanted to participate. So Region 16 was a region for anybody to participate who felt that they didn't have a place in the, in the structure. So each particular church, after, I mean, my diocese compiled thousands of pages, had to send in 10 pages. Then the entire United States got 10 pages. I mean, talk about a crazy process of reduction. So we, we participated in all of this listening. That's a listening session at my college. This produced the United States report. If I, w I will tell you there's many good things written about the Synod. In my opinion, I, I think that the Catholic Church in the United States can often be experienced as quite polarized. And so I think many people are a little bit nervous about what would the US report look like. And I'm giving you my honest opinion. I think it's a beautiful document about the life of the Catholic Church right now. It's, it's a 10-page read that's worth taking a look at. So there was 112 national reports submitted. So here we are meeting to talk about these 112 reports. I'm over there um, on the left. Here's me sitting in the Theological Commission meeting thinking about what we're gonna do with these reports. Here is me standing with Cardinal Grech, who's the head of the Synod and some other theologians. And this woman in the blue dress is a good friend of mine. And she said to me right after this picture, she said, you know, Kristen, they're picking three people from each continent to read these 112 reports and summarize them in 20 pages. And I was like, <laughs> well, I don't know who those people are going to be, but I'll be in the bathroom while those decisions are being made. But I was chosen. I was one of th three people from North America. So three people from North America, three people from South America, three people from each continent met to read these 112 reports and distill them into 20 pages. So what did the church hear? What did the people of God, when they got to speak without limitation, say? <clears throat> we gathered in Frascati, Italy. There were seven priests, nine lay people, eight religious, three people from each continent. We wrote this document called Enlarge the Space of Your Tent. This is Cardinal Gregg telling us, you have to open your heart. You can't come in with assumptions. You can't write what you want to say, that it will be a sin if you don't let the people of God speak. Don't come in with your own presumptions. So this is a group of us in a small listening session going over some of these reports. And it's just a coincidence that we're all women. So there's myself. There's a woman from Africa, a woman from Asia a woman from the US who works in Rome at the Vatican, a woman from Peru, a woman from Germany, a woman from Australia. And we had such a powerful session reading these reports that I literally had just gone into the hallway and gotten someone who worked at the guest house to come in and take this picture. And then I looked at it the next day and I saw Pope Francis on the left. <laughs> and Pope the next day on the Vatican's website, it said, Pope Francis listens to women, and this picture was, was there. <laughs> okay, so you would say, Kristen, 
What was the most shocking takeaway you had from these reports? Or what was the hardest thing? Or what stands out the most? And, you know, I took this so seriously, like prayerfully reading these 112 reports. I was so nervous about it because I was like, what if one group wants this and one group wants that? Like, who are we going to listen to? Whose voices are going to get into these pages? And the most clear takeaway from these reports was how similar what the people of God around the world want. Okay, The similarity between these 112 reports was amazing. And to me, it's a sign of the Holy Spirit speak the people hear the holy spirit speaking and they have a sense of the faith so what did they say they said the church is synodal there's no going back we can't go away from this listening process this is the church's identity um, they said that listening is the anecdote antidote for polarization what is the way past polarization it's the synod it's listening the number one thing, if you said, Kristen, I'm going to push you off this cliff if you don't tell me the number one thing you heard in these reports, the number one thing was people around the world want more formation. I love this quote from Zimbabwe. The thirst for formation runs through almost every synod submission. People want to know the faith more. They want to be trained to do more things. They want to participate. They want more participation. They want lay leaders to be able to do more things, and they want more people to be able to participate. They want a new style of leadership. They want to go beyond clericalism, authoritarian styles of governance. <clears throat> they want... <laughs> now, uh, tonight was definitely not an example of this, but almost every report said, we want better homilies. <clears throat> we want more vibrant liturgies. So many reports lament. I, the US report talks about the ache of youth leaving the church. We want more enculturation. People, countries in Africa said, we want to be able to pray in our own tongue, and there's not enough liturgical resources that reflect our culture. And people in Europe said, the gap between religion and society is growing so vast, we're not sure it can be bridged. The world calls for a reconsideration of the roles of women. One of the things that sometimes people would say is that some countries want one thing, some countries want another thing. Not every country is in the same place on every issue. I can tell you from reading these reports, countries around the world are in the same place about redefining a role for women. OK, so this is the, us after we read all these reports. The, the head writer sent us on a day we tried to have fun. We are at Castle Gandolfo. They told us that everybody had to bring all these people from the continents. You had to bring one food that represented your continent, and we would have a big party. The Vatican would pay for us to have one drink per night at the bar, OK? <laughs> so we would all rush out of dinner and find out which drink was the biggest one. And then I remember we were three people from every continent, and somebody brought a keyboard. And you know, we all were listening with translators, like we didn't speak the same language, but the guy on the keyboard started say, playing, this is totally true, started playing a song. I'm like, what song is he going to play that everybody knows? He sang, he played Yesterday by the Beatles, and every single person in the room knew every word to that song. <laughs> but this is us working, you know, again, really taking our job seriously. Okay. So then we took the document to Pope Francis for his approval. He, wa he daily wanted updates. This is when we took, he wanted a picture with all the women. So this is Pope Francis and all the women the last day. This is us celebrating with Cardinal Grech afterwards that we had, you know, created a document we really like. One thing I'll say, I got about five more minutes here. One thing I'll say is that this document, and it represents the whole synod, we were not trying to theologize. We were not trying to explain. We weren't taking these reports and saying, you know, Vatican II says this, and we heard this in the document. What we did is we took the voices of the people of God, and we lifted them up, and we offered them back to the world, and we were trying to say, this is what we heard you say. 
this is what we heard you say. Did you, is this what you said? We're not trying to explain it or, or put our own spin on it. This is what we heard you say. So then this, all these reports went to these different continents. This is a, a mishmash picture of all the continental groups meeting. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the, I, I can't be a card-carrying ecclesiologist if I don't say this right now. Um, one thing that's really interesting about the synod is that the Catholic Church has never had a super strong regional level of authority. We have Rome, we have the local churches, but we've always had a hard time figuring out what regional bodies look like. But Pope Francis said, I want you to reflect as continents, and boom, we're reflecting as continents. That's never happened before. So the synod is universal level, local level, regional level, universal, regional, universal, local, because Pope Francis is showing us how to be synodal. He's not just writing documents about it. He's creating things in our church to make this possible. OK, so in October 2024, all the bishops came together. This is Timothy Radcliffe, who was the spiritual advisor for the synod. And he led a retreat. Beautiful, my friends. The synod starts with a retreat because it's about prayer. And it's about listening to the spirit. It's not just a meeting. So here's T Timothy Radcliffe. We're raising a glass to Timothy Radcliffe for being selected for this great job. OK, now, the synod, normally when a synod would come together in history, what it would do would be it's trying to write a document. So it's editing. It's really like taking a, a draft and like editing a text. But what the synod did in 2024 was the Vatican handed out worksheets, worksheets, worksheets. By virtue of being a worksheet, the Vatican is saying, we don't have all the answers because we're not here to give some predefined answer. We're here to talk. How else do we know that? OK, here's some of the questions really quickly. How can we create spaces where those who feel hurt by the church and unwelcome by the community feel recognized, received, free to ask questions and not judged? Amazing. This is what the Synod is talking about. Now, should bishops discern together with or separately from the other members of the people of God? Do both options have a place in a synodal church? This question is saying, are decisions always made by bishops? Or sometimes should the bishops be including other people in the decision making? And what would those cases look like? Most of the continental assemblies and the synthesis of several Episcopal conferences call for the question of women's inclusion in the diaconate to be considered. Is it possible to envision this and in what way? So what I'm telling you is that what this, the synod did is it heard what the people of God said. And instead of telling them what they said, it offered it back in the form of a question. I heard you say this, what can we do? And then without diminishing appreciation for the sacrament of orders, i.e. hierarchy, ministries in a synodal horizon are understood from a ministerial conception of the entire church. A serene reception of the Second Vatican Council emerges with recognition of baptismal dignity as the foundation of everyone's participation in the life of the church. Hierarchy doesn't come first, baptism comes first. Anybody who's ordained is baptized, we share in the dignity of baptism, is more important than we're different that you're ordained and I'm not. Okay, we had women voting at the Synod for the first time. Here on the your left is Cynthia Bailey Manns, Dr. Cynthia Bailey Manns. She's from Minnesota. She was one of 10 delegates from the US. On the right is Julia Ozeka. She's a 22-year-old student at St. Joseph University in Philadelphia. We had women voting at the Synod for the first time. The where. This is what the Synod looked like. Now this is how this room normally looks but they redid the room to look like this because it's about talking to each other. It's not about listening to people speaking at a podium. 
Okay, so where are we going next? Okay, friends, yesterday, um, I never did social media in my life. I know I, I look so young and vibrant, but I, <laughs> I never did social media, but I honestly joined to follow the Synod's Instagram page. Because the Synod yesterday, publicly, I mean, again, two days ago, I was talking to people in Rome, my friends, and we were all like, oh my gosh, there were no dates for October. The Synod concludes in October with another month-long meeting. There were no dates. The dates came out yesterday, October 2nd to the 27th. Okay, so we're going to be in the round tables again. The report that the Synod put out after the round table gathering raises 20 topics. Here's five of them. What are the structures of participation? What does mission look like in a digital environment? What is the role of deacons and priests in a synodal church? Women in the life and mission of the church on the road towards Christian unity. So I don't know if you've heard of this yet. Hopefully you have. Now we're going to have another local phase during Lent where every local church is going to be asked to have more listening sessions and have these are the two questions. Where have I seen or experienced success, successes and distresses within the church's structure, organization, leadership that encourage or hinder its mission? And how can the structures and organization of the church help all the baptized to respond to the call to proclaim the gospel and live as a community of love and mercy in Christ? Now here's a surprise, my friends. What's gonna happen between now and next October? The canon lawyers are working really hard because Canon lawyers we think of as annulments and we think of as kind of boring and technical, but if you want to live synodality, canon law is a huge ally. Canon law can mandate when people have to be consulted and who makes up participants in certain decision-making bodies. It's really important. The theologians now are, list, are taking what was said through this process and for the first time trying to put some shape on it and say, well, this echoes our tradition and this connects to this. Okay, these are my daughters. My one daughter's up here. She doesn't know this is here. Um, <laughs> this is my last word on the synod. Um, listening and accompanying people and having a co-responsibility of all the baptized in the church is a messy, difficult process. Synodality is hard. And it will take time to make decisions and sometimes the process breaks down. So what we need in a synodal church also is deep experiences of Christ that can be with us and accompany us so that when things get messy or frustrating, we don't walk away. Like, I worry that too many young adults in the church today don't have patience for the church to navigate some of these questions because they don't have experiences that give them that patience. So the Synod is not just about decision-making, it's not just about structures, it's not just about updating. It's also got to be about encounter accompaniment and experiences that can sustain us in this process of trying to be a church that listens and walks together. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kristen, for just walking through the whole process and helping us to understand that as well as your own experiences. And the images are so captivating, I think, and the differences of how the Synod is now working. Um, so this is your side job. So thinking about your actual like day job that you get paid for to go and teach and work and do, um, how do you bring all this back into being a theologian at a Catholic school in Minnesota? I'm going to try to keep my questions, answers to the questions really short so that we can get some questions. Um, to be honest, it's so relevant because part of my job is I train ministers and these ministers want to know, um, for example, you know, how can we get past a binary of seeing lay ministers or ordained people to work together? Um, I think, to be honest, the synod to me is supremely relevant. I would encourage all of you to look at these documents as teaching tools. Um, 
it's it's hard to do two jobs at once, but the two jobs go together like completely very, very well. I feel really honored to have this perspective to teach my students with. Should I call you? Kristen's great. Professor? No, Kristen's great. <laughs> um, oh, this is so tall and I'm so short. Uh, I was wondering, you, one of the things you brought up at the end of your presentation was the fact that a lot of young people are really impatient for the church to change. And one thing that came to mind, and we spoke here at St. Thomas Four in our synod about, um, and you obviously brought up again, was the fact that women do not hold, you know, deaconships, but, you know, and in, in the Anglican church, they can administer communion, confession, you know, everything. And that's not a possibility or not canon law in the Catholic church, despite the historical precedent for that. Um, I was curious, you say this, but at the same time, if someone's considering vocation, for example, as a nun, they take, you know, different rights than a priest does. For example, as Sister Jen knows, um, you take a vow of um, poverty and, for example, priests don't. And so they're allowed to, you know, accept money from their family and things like that, whereas, you know, nuns aren't. And also women in the church who go through rites aren't allowed to, you know, give the homily or perform mass and you know you say oh you're impatient but what about the thousands of years that women have been overlooked in the church i'm i'm tempted to say that you know as someone who's raised roman catholic and has considered a vocation in the church i can't see myself becoming a catholic nun because i wouldn't have the rights and privileges as a man just because of that i was born a woman um and i think that's something to consider as someone who's, despite being raised Catholic, I went to Anglican school and I saw women giving communion that I couldn't have. Mm. Um, and I saw that, you know, and obviously you guys had a synod with the Anglican church and that was one of the major questions. Um, but, you know, along those lines, you know, there are these things that, for example, if you're LGBTQ plus mm. um, and the church wouldn't allow you to get married, would you become, you know, a nun or a priest if, you know, the canon law of this organization goes against who you are as a person. I'm just curious, how patient mm -hmm. does one need to be before mm -hmm. Vatican III happens? Mm -hmm. um, that, that is my question, because you are, after all, an insider. Um, okay, yeah. I'm gonna, that's such a great question and a huge question. I'm gonna try to answer it in three parts, but sh somewhat short. Um, the first part is that I, had a chance to make an intervention a few times at the synod um, at different points, not the not in front of the October assembly, but in the theological commission. And what I have said to people is kind of similar to what you're saying, is that we have to remember that we're not asking the same patience from everyone. Some people are being asked to have a much greater level of patience that we, Patience can be a luxury sometimes. When we think, well, I can be patient till the church changes on this issue because it's not affecting my life, okay? So I think the church needs a greater awareness that asking for patience, what that really entails and that not everyone is being asked to sacrifice and have patience in the same way. Um, a second point I would say is that in my mind, and this is just Chris and Kohlberg, not theological commission, um, if Pope Francis wanted to bring about real changes in the church, I think the greatest way to do it is to hold these listening sessions and hear from people around the world that the question of women needs to be reconsidered. Rather than Pope Francis deciding to do something on his own initiative that some people will critique and some people will uh, push back on, like Pope Francis has got major credibility here because every report says this issue needs to be rethought, okay? So I think this question of women in the church came across very clearly at the Synod. So for example, when you were on the floor of the Synod, many, many topics were discussed, but not all topics make it into the report. The topics that make it into the report are the topics that the Synod delegates feel like they might be ready to do something about, and the question of women is one of those, okay? So I think that we will see serious consideration of women in the Catholic Church moving forward. Now, what that's gonna look like, I don't know. 
Um, and then there was a third point of this, but I can't remember what it was. Uh, so I'll have to leave it at two. Okay. Thank you. So I think one really interesting and important quote about the role of the Synod from Pope Francis is the quote where he says, the Synod is not a parliament. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I take it to him to be saying here that while we recognize, you know, sort of, as you brought out, the sort of two dimension, two, two visions of what the church can look like, you say sort of a more egalitarian dimension and then one with, with sort of hierarchy and authority. I take what he's saying here with this quote is that um, while we do want to bring in more of this horizontal egalitarian dimension, that vertical dimension of authority um, uh, and hierarchy is essential to, to what the church is. Um, so I guess I just want to ask, you know, as a theologian and ecclesiologist, why is it important that the church uh, maintain this uh, vertical dimension so it doesn't descend into a parliament? I love this question. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Okay, I will tell you that ecclesiologists and everyone, I shouldn't, I can't speak for everyone, but many people on the Theological Commission don't like the statement, the synod is not a parliament, because it's, it's a negative statement. <laughs> we, we'd like to know the synod is positive statement. Um, but one of the things that we talk a lot about in the synod is that the Catholic Church needs to rethink and better educate people on how decision making happens in the Catholic Church, okay? So one of the things we spent a lot of time talking about is this idea that there's a difference between decision making and decision taking. So the, not, the only person that has authority is not just the person who makes a final choice. That decision making is a communal process that involves the whole community. It involves the people who are going to research the decision, the people who know the past, the people who are going to execute the decision, the people who are going to assess the decision, the people who are going to listen to the voices. That decision making has diffuse responsibility, even though our community charges one person with being the decision taker. Um, but the decision taker is not the only person that bears dignity and responsibility in the process. We think that, again, we also, when we talk about the census fide, which is all the baptized having an innate sense of the faith, and we have to listen to the, all the people of God because we can know what the Holy Spirit is saying by listening to them. We also have to realize that the census fide is not a counting of heads. It's not a democracy. Sometimes a, a prophetic minority can be the one that is lifting up the truth in a situation. So one of the questions that we ask, especially in ecumenical dialogue with the Anglicans right now is, how can we know the census fide fidelium sooner? <laughs> how can we come to a more clear understanding of what the Spirit is revealing? One last anecdote on this is, I gave a talk similar to this at Notre Dame not that long ago, and somebody said to me, Kristen, please just say that the synod is not open mic night in the Catholic Church, okay? <laughs> that we don't want the synod to be anything goes. And we don't want the synod to be um, not a discerning of how the voices today resonate with our tradition and how the resources of um, what we believe, we believe that our church is guided by these authority figures like the Pope. So, how do we listen to all the voices of the people of God, respect the instruments of the gift of divine guidance that God gives the church, um, and sometimes find the census fidelium in, in a minority or over time? This is the last thing I'll say about that. I'm, the, the dialogue with Anglicans right now is on moral decision making, and we're looking at contraception as a case study. And we, are trying to understand what, why churches make the choices that they make. And one of the things that we realize is that churches have to provide guidance to people in real time. And sometimes they have to make decisions they're not ready to make because they have guidance is needed even though they don't feel like they've exhausted the process of discernment. So like, how does the role of the pope and the bishops fit into this process of determining what the Holy Spirit is revealing? Um, I think that's a question that the synod is, is 
tops on its list of how it's trying to come up with a satisfying answer for. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. So it's, it's no secret that the Catholic Church, at least in like the Western world, is having a big problem with vocations, especially the priesthood. Um, it's like why we pray after mass for mm -hmm. vocations at our chases. Um, so I'm curious, like we, we focus a lot about the role of the laity and um, in general, but how do we kind of make the priesthood attractive to young men who maybe feel like the priesthood is just one of many options when it really is the central like um, thing, uh, central vocation within the church mm -hmm. to like um, administer the sacraments and kind of guide um, the the universal body. You guys, you ask such easy questions. <laughs> um, one response I'm going to say to your question is that when we were in writing some of these documents, we would keep a chair in the room, an empty chair. And we would say to ourselves, whose voices are we not hearing in, this, in these reports? Okay? Like, whose voice... Are there, the, are there prophetic voices that we're skipping over? Or are there voices that are not there? And one of the voices that we came to a conclusion that were not in these reports were the voices of priests. There was a sense by many priests that this was a time for the laity to speak. So they would sometimes facilitate listening sessions without putting in their own voice. Um, so one thing takeaway from the synod is that we don't know what the priests want, and more work needs to be done on that. Where we do hear the priest's voices in the synod documents, sometimes in the reports we hear them say they feel a lack of closeness with their bishop. Um, we feel that sometimes priests feel very discouraged because Pope Francis is, is, and the synod process has been very adamant against clericalism. But sometimes the only time priests get mentioned is when we're saying we don't want clericalism. So like, where's the support of priests who are giving their life to the church? Um, so I think that the questions of authority that the church is trying to navigate in this process are to understand the baptismal dignity that all the baptized share as a motive or a, the major source of authority, but to also understand the distinctive role that the ordained ministry plays in the church. One of the critiques that the synod gets, which I'm happy to, to name, is that it talks too much about baptismal priesthood and authority and not enough about the distinction of ordained, the authority of ordained ministers. So we need to talk about that. We need to hear what priests want. We need to not only talk about clericalism, priests in the key of clericalism, and moving forward with the synod, you know, another big one is, just to add one more, that's really big on the synod's radar screen, is seminary formation. And helping seminaries understand um, the training of priests so that so that priests can flourish and they have the resources they need to thrive. But that doesn't solve the vocation question, but there's a few answers. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Um, thank you so much. I didn't really know this was going I've heard of synodality. I didn't really know this was exactly what was going on. So um, I'm very grateful to, to see that this is what's going on. It was very helpful to see, um, see this. But, I wonder, you know, on the topic of which voices aren't being heard, you know, it seems like a lot of, you know, a potential, you know, aspect of improvement. It seems like a lot of these, you know, you volunteer to be in these, you know, these synod dialogues and, you know, maybe some people don't know about what's going on. Um, baptized Catholics may not, um, you know, they might be busy. You know, we live in a culture of busyness. So I wonder, you know, this, the group that volunteers might be a little bit self-selecting. How do you kind of get over those barriers to, to maybe get some of those voices that, that mm. didn't, either didn't get a, an opportunity to, to share their opinions, mm. or maybe you know, we're a little bit too lazy to prioritize this? <laughs> and look, it, that's, that's definitely you know, yeah, I yeah. me, because I'm just learning about this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and then this, the second question, too, it's kind of related, is why, why end up baptized individuals? You know, if, it's, if we're all called to be children of God, why, 
-hmm. Why is it just the baptized yeah. group? And also the church is supposed to have an impact on the entire world, which I hope it does. And I, you know, yeah, um, yeah why I'm just end there? Yeah. Again, these softballs you guys keep throwing. Um, okay. One thing that Pope Francis was very adamant about from the beginning of this process was that in mandating these sessions, which I think, again, is worth noting, you know, sometimes we have grassroots reform, which is really important. But here we have a case of the center kind of mandating a reform that leads to grassroots efforts. So Pope Francis mandates in this kind of dictatorial way in some ways, every local church is going to do this. And part of his mandate was that you had to reach out to people beyond just regular mass goers. Okay? So Pope Francis was very adamant. I want you to invite people to these listening sessions that have left the church, that are on the verge of leaving the church, ecumenical partners, people in your community. So there, there was a very important effort by Pope Francis to try to get not just the regular, sub, un, you know, the involved people involved. Now, one thing I'll say to your question is that when I traveled around the country and worked with diocesan leaders, one thing they were very sensitive to is the fact that if, if you have a table that someone feels like they've been excluded from, inviting them back to that same table is not necessarily that appealing. So it can't just be like, we're ready to listen now, come on back. You know, it had, to, it was supposed to be partnering with people, you know, building a new table together that people could come together to listen because synodality listening sessions make you vulnerable. And the last thing anybody church leader that I know wanted was to create a space where people were making themselves vulnerable and then felt victimized. Okay. So there was a great deal of effort, but certainly not enough. And certainly I think that was disappointing to many people that that the listening sessions didn't have more diversity involved with them. Um, when the voting delegates were picked for every um, continent and every national church, every bishop in the country was asked to submit names. So it wasn't, I'm sure these two people up here were shocked. It wasn't like they volunteered. Um, there really was an effort to bring in people that represent diverse points of view and diverse ages and diverse levels of involvement in the church. Um, the baptism question, that is, to be honest, a really important one. It's one the Synod is really working on because it's trying to honor the dignity of baptism and that we think something absolutely fundamental to the Christian life happens in baptism. But then there is a question that you're raising, which is if God created all people and all people have their origin and destiny in God, then why would we limit the listening to people who are baptized? One of the reasons why we uh, highlight baptism is theologically, also ecumenically, because it unites us with a lot of people. Um, but uh, the question that you're asking is one that is really, I just spent a lot of time last week working on that with some other members of the Theological Commission, because we have to square different beliefs about the dignity of all people as created in God's image and the importance of baptism. How do we say those things together? Um, it's a profound insight that you would ask such an important question. Okay. Hello. Hello. So I'm, I'm recovering from a concussion, so I had to write my question down. So no I worries. Keep all my thoughts together. So I'll start by saying I'm depending on who you ask here, I'm not a very traditional Catholic. I'm not a big fan of Thomas Aquinas, for instance, and my friends never cease to annoy me about that, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm married to an Aquinas scholar, so... Ah, I see. I, I'm on the page with you. I, I, know, I know of what you speak. So you know what it's like to live with him. Great, great. All right. So you noted that Pope Francis and synodality emphasizes inclusion and stopping polarization. Uh -huh. Yet many in the church, rightly or wrongly, feel like he himself is incredibly polarizing, taking away mass preferences of people, shutting down anyone, priests, bishops, or lay people who disagree with them. To many people, that does not sound like someone who believes in power at the local or regional level. It sounds instead like someone who uses Rome as a powerful entity that extends far beyond its bishopric. You said also that the synod is about allowing questions without judgment, 
Yet I'm sure that there are many traditional and conservative-minded people in this room who would feel uncomfortable asking questions that may ruffle feathers. I think we can pat ourselves on the back and pretend that everything is okay, and that everyone loves Vatican II, and that Pope Francis is a clear and unifying pope, or we can ask ourselves the question, is the positive vision we are painting true to the reality, and is Pope Francis as inclusive as we claim, or do we need to, need to dig deeper and critically analyze if this rosy-colored picture we are painting of Vatican II, synodality, and Pope Francis is actually the case? Mm, thank you. Uh, Another em person in the empty chair that we would identify is more traditional Catholics uh, and wonder, did they participate in the synod process and do we hear their voices in these reports? So definitely a question that we would ask ourselves is have the voices of Catholics who, who feel that this overly rosy picture of, of updating uh, are being heard in this process. Um, I think that one thing I think about Pope Francis, for my opinion, is that I think Pope Francis is willing to allow a pretty high degree of tension. <laughs> like, I think Pope Francis is willing to allow some debates to play out because he wants, he doesn't, he wants to avoid oversimplifying. I've seen many, many occasions where I've, um, seen Pope Francis maybe make a decision that wasn't popular, but rather than follow it up with another kind of clarifying decision, like allow that tension to um, be debated within the church. So I, I think my opinion is that, um, I think fundamentally I would stick with my original point that I think Pope Francis is trying to create spaces for listening, which he seeks to overcome polarization. I do think that there are instances in which Pope Francis has not stopped a polarized fight because he's willing to let it be debated within the church without him bringing a stop to it. Um, so I do think there's a lot of ways that the synod is not perfect and isn't a rosy, um, harmonious, conversation. We could see that by the percentage of people around the world that participated in the Synod. It's not as high as we would like. Um, we can see many people feeling their voices haven't been heard in the process. So I think you're, you're right to portray, a, there, there's room to create a more balanced view of this process. Um, in terms of Pope Francis in particular, I think that part of the reason he is the figure at the center of some polarization is he's made some choices that he thought was right, but then didn't step in to oversimplify and end the argument. But I think you're, I take your point very, your point is well taken by me. Hi. Hello. Um, I have a question about accessibility of the Synod. Um, often Vatican documents and council documents are not uh, the, the most delightful of reads for the average person. <laughs> I'm so sorry. They're fun. I, my background's in theology. I think they're fun too. But um, for the average Catholic, this can be a very overwhelming process mm -hmm. outside of the listening sessions. Um, and the texts themselves can be very difficult and, and jargon heavy as far as their theological and um, judicial language. And I'm curious what measures the Synod has taken in order to create a situation in which the documents that it's asking people to consider and to speak to whether or not it reflects them are ones that they can actually engage with or yeah. written with them in mind and not necessarily the hierarchy in, in mind. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I forgot where I was gonna start with this. I think that um, if you want my opinion, and again, I do this for a living, so I, I, I think if you read the US National Report, or you read the enlarge the space of your tent, those are very, those documents in my mind have real authenticity because they're not theologized. They are really just offering back, this is what we heard you say. So I think that 
People in this room who have not read the U.S. national document or the document that synthesizes the reports should not be like afraid to read those like they're hard to read. I actually think they're quite readable. The problem with the Synod, I was just in Rome about a month ago, and I was sitting with a group of people in a circle that are involved with the Synod, and these are people who are there every day, and they said, the Synod is overwhelming. Like, I don't, I don't even know what's going on in the Synod because, like, I was there, and, you know, there's so much to read and so much to know, and then there was this document, and then there was that document, and then there was this question, and there was that. I agree with you. Like, I feel the Synod is overwhelming. Okay, but I think that you can bite off a piece. I really do think that the Vatican's Instagram page and the graphics they create for the Synod are super helpful. I will say that Carrie Robinson, um, the Leadership Roundtable has put out some of the most digestible texts on the Synod that like, how do I hold a listening session? You know, like, so I would say that this is a global historic process and it has produced a lot of stuff. I would say don't feel overwhelmed in the stuff. Pick one document, you know? Like some, a good friend of mine, so I don't know what diocese are your home diocese, but a good friend of mine recommended something I think is really interesting. Read the, the report of your home diocese and if your home diocese is like partnered with another diocese overseas, read that. And um, it's enough to get a sense of, of what the Synod is trying to do. I'll just say, you know, not everything is meant to be read. Some stuff has to be geared at theologians who are trying to help the process. So pick something that's geared for, for a more general audience and just go with that. All right, the last question. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for your talk. I think I'll just like end on like a more basic practical question. Um, and it's this, like I like to talk a lot with people mm -hmm. about issues like theology and religion and philosophy in the church. And I think I'd probably echo a lot of people in this room by taking great joy in those things and growing a lot from those conversations, both with Catholics, but also people of other faiths and people of like, no faith at all. But I find that often it gets hard in these conversations to maintain a spirit of love and charity when it's like three hours you're having fundamental disagreements on things of like, you know, theology or like liturgy or stuff like that. Um, and then it can get into kind of areas where like you have to start fighting your own pride and kind of like intellectual arrogance. Um, and so I guess like as someone who like works in like the, like the big leagues of like kind of theological discussion, <laughs> like just like practical advice for like, you know, when you are having kind of problems with like, not understanding people or like just really not like agreeing with people, hmm. how do you still keep a perspective of love and mutual growth when you want to stick to your values and your beliefs and you don't feel like, you know, maybe you, you should give way on a certain thing yet? It's such an awesome question to end on too. Um, so like I am somebody who teaches masters, undergrads and master's students all the time on Issues in the church that people debate, okay? And even, I know sometimes students think teachers, like, you know, glide above it all. But it's stressful sometimes for me to see students, you know, really going at it at each other with, without charity. <clears throat> and one, one thing I've really done in the last two years that has been beautiful in my mind is that um, the synod, you know, offers us this model of speaking, followed by silence. And then another person, you know, I mean, I know this sounds awkward for like a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, when you're debating with someone, but I have, to be honest, really used it quite effectively where I think the posture towards the conversation really matters, okay? With synodality, you know, we enter not to win an argument and we enter not to have our voice carry the day. We enter to discern what the Holy Spirit is calling us to as a church or as a community. So I think your posture towards the conversation matters. Like what's going on here? Am I trying to get my point of view across? Am I trying to hear what the other person has to say? Am I allowing myself to grow in hearing what the other person has to say? Um, I think the posture is incredibly important. I think moments of silence are really important. And 
this might sound really awkward, um, but I, I'm saying it with 100% sincerity. If I'm really going to exchange theological ideas with someone who's also really devoted to faith, beginning and ending with a prayer makes a huge difference. It makes an absolutely enormous difference. And a lot of the times what I'd say in the prayer is, for all the things that haven't yet been said, or the things that were said more harshly than was intended, you know, we ask you, God, to, to, to hold those things and to, to be with us, you know, as two people as this group of people continues to know you and serve you more deeply. And I have just really seen that have an absolutely transformative effect on individuals and groups. So again, it, it mirrors all of synodality, which is trying, the goal is not, is not so I win. <laughs> it's not the dialectic of winning an argument. It's this dialectic of listening. Um, and then one thing that's so beautiful about the synod and the listening sessions is people say it was the first time in many years I got to talk without being interrupted or contradicted or judged. But I just got to talk. I just got to say what I wanted to say. And sometimes just being able to say that makes you feel like better and like you can listen to the other person more deeply. So, I don't know, maybe that's helpful. I couldn't thank you guys all enough so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kohlberg, for all of these insights and for all of you for joining us tonight. And we invite you to come back next week for the Reverend Robert L. Beloyne lecture where Shannon Wimp Schmidt will be addressing the topic, Awake, O Sleeper, a Black Catholic's Journey of Decolonizing and Reconstructing Faith. There are a few copies of Dr. Kohlberg's books available for sale, and I'm sure she'd be happy to sign them. Also, I invite you to come up and have conversations with her if your questions didn't get answered. Thank you. <laughs>